Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is the only presentation I ever give where I don't put my name on the front of it, because this little girl's significantly more important than any of us in the room. How many of you have not come across the diary of Anne Frank during your lives? No. We were all exposed to it. A lot of us at school, a lot of us by chance, a lot of us by our parents. And that was a result of her father, Otto, allowing it to be published um, in the 1950s and all sorts of other um, plays, um, um, musical works, ballet and all sorts of things were done with her work. But it's only recently that the full story has come out and it's a terribly important one. Most of my subjects normally have a little bit of humour. It's going to be very difficult to get a lot of humour out of this story but what I hope to be able to do is not read you the diaries. I expect you to read them again afterwards. Um, it's at least to put the diaries or the, the book that she wrote into context and to give you a little bit of knowledge about the situation that the Franks and all the other minority groups and particularly the Jewish people were in in the time when she went into hiding and also what happened and how it all came out. But let's first talk about Anne herself. She was born in Frankfurt in Germany. She was German. Um, she could speak German, French, English. Uh, her father, Otto, and her mother, Edith, both were very, very serious about educating their children. Um, they had a very happy upbringing in a, a, an area near Frankfurt, um, a, a suburb of Frankfurt, which was uh, not Orthodox Jewish. They were um, secular Jewish. Um, they practiced a number of the Jewish elements of the religion, but they were not um, Orthodox, and it was an integrated community. Um, she had her sister, Margot, who was born in 1926, and until 1933, they lived in Frankfurt. In 1933, her father, who worked for a German company called Opecta, was asked if he would go and run the offices in Amsterdam. And he could already see in 1933 what was happening in his home country with the rise of National Socialism. So he took the opportunity to move first himself and then the rest of his family to an apartment uh, in, in Amsterdam where they lived um, until they went into hiding. Uh, he was quite a distinguished soldier in the German army in World War I. Uh, Otto, he won the Iron Cross. Um, and so many Jewish people who went through the Holocaust, uh, when they were uh, arrested or they were detained, they would say, hold on a minute, I'm a German and I, I was in the last war and I fought for my country and so on. He was one of those. They were assimilated and they'd previously been in Frankfurt, which was a relatively tolerant city. They were middle class, secular. They had a wide family, they'd have dispersed, as National Socialism grew, it became clear that Germany was not going to be a friendly place to the Jews. Anybody who had anything to know about Adolf Hitler and his cronies knew that that's what would happen. The problem was that unless you were reasonably wealthy, well-read, intelligent and had the means, it was extremely difficult to get out of Nazi Germany. In 1933, uh, Germ um, the Germans came into power. But because the Franks were quite wealthy, we have a lot of information about them because they were able, they owned a, 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 a camera, they took family snapshots, which are now available, um, and you'll see quite a few of them during my presentation. But when Adolf Hitler came to power, luckily, this move that Otto had made to Amsterdam was what so many other German Jews were trying, well, not just German Jews, French, all, all Jews in Western Europe particularly, uh, were trying to do was to get out of the country. So let's talk a little bit about the National Socialist Movement. 1919 to 1920, it was called the German Workers' Party and it wasn't as nationalist as it became. But of course, the depression that occurred around the world affected Germany particularly uh, when you would have to take a wheelbarrow full of Deutschmarks in order to buy a loaf of bread and you would burn your money to heat your house. The inflation was so high. In 1921, Adolf Hitler became leader of the party and anybody who had read 
And this was after a number of things that had happened, uh, uh, including him going to prison. Whilst he was in prison, he wrote his book, Mein Kampf. Anybody who, at the time, or even today, manages to plough through that rubbish will discover that his plans for the Soviet Union and for the Jews are clearly laid out. So anybody who lived in Germany at the time that Adolf Hitler got into power knew that their life was not going to be comfortable anymore. He rises to power. In 1933, he becomes the Chancellor. But not only that, he manages to get both President and Chancellor offices for himself. He becomes a dictator. And the first thing he does is the Enabling Act. And the Enabling Act gave him the total power to do what he liked without referring to anybody or any elected assembly. And the first thing he wanted to do was the first on that list of the two priorities had, he had was to create what he called Lebensraum, living space for the German people. And by the German people, he defined them very specifically as Aryans. And uh, actually, he believed that the Dutch people were Aryan and the British people were Aryan. Um, so he had some uh, idea of where he was going with his expansion plans in Europe. And initially, they didn't necessarily include the countries to the southwest of him. But this is... Germany, 1933 to 1939, and you can see the size of Germany in 1933. The remilitarization of the Rhineland, which had been given away in the, 19, uh, in the 1919 Versailles Treaty as a sort of buffer zone, which really offended the Germans. In fact, some people say that the Treaty of Versailles of 1919 was the direct declaration of war of 1939 because it um, made the Germans into such a, put them into such a terrible state, they were, they were open to the sort of thing that Hitler was doing. Um, the Sudetenland, again, an area that was taken off them, they believed, after, after the First War was taken back over. The Anschluss of Austria, 1938, Czechoslovakia. So this whole area, and then the invasion, in the 1st of September 1939, takes in the whole of Poland. East Prussia was already German. But look at this bit. The people of Poland, particularly the Jews, didn't just have the Germans on one side of them. Because of the molotov ribbentrop Pact of August 1939, the Russians also invaded. And the Poles had them on both fronts. So the start of the Second World War, the 1st of September 1939, everything looked pretty grim. But countries like Luxembourg, Belgium, and the Netherlands don't get fooled by calling it Holland. Holland is only a part of the Netherlands. The whole country is the Netherlands. There are various parts, and one is called Holland. It's an easy mistake to make. But if you take the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, they immediately declared themselves neutral. But of course, France and Great Britain had a treaty whereby they would support Poland. So they went immediately and declared war on, uh, on Germany. Prior to that, they'd already seen what was happening in Germany with the Jewish boycott. There were over 2,000, since after the 1933 Enabling Act, there were 2,000 decrees that were anti-Jewish that were passed without any assembly looking at them. They were just passed by the dictatorship. Immediately, they had what they called the Preservation of the Civil Service Act, which meant that nobody could be in medicine, doctors, nurses, or midwives. They immediately stripped anybody who was a lawyer or a judge of their, their job. They couldn't sit anymore. Teachers were not allowed to teach in non Jewish schools and or in the public sector. Jews was, were stripped of their citizenship. And this made a great deal of difficulty for them in trying to go to another country. First of all, not many countries would take them. And second of all, they were stateless people. Their identity card was immediately stamped with a J long before they had to wear the Star of David. So in each of the countries that uh, the Germans took over, 
um, they started to impose these measures with these various acts. They immediately started to throw out, I mean, for example, the um, uh, senior intelligentsia of the country immediately started to leave and they lost um, 14 um, research physicists straight away. Einstein, Fermi, Oppenheimer, names that may be familiar to you. Ten of those 14 research physicists that they lost because of their Jewish background and they wanted to leave eventually either had or eventually had Nobel Peace Prize, Nobel Prizes for physics. And of course the Manhattan Project and the atom bomb was led by physicists that had been expelled or had left Nazi Germany. They were not allowed to have their own businesses, they marry non-Jews, they were not allowed to f employ females under 45, they weren't allowed to raise the German flag, they were not allowed to engage in agriculture. That meant even owning and tilling their own garden, their backyard. They were not allowed to attend a public school, movie theatres, concerts, or own any precious metals or stones. And that was what's called, now called spoliation. That was a way in which the German state took the jewellery, the gold, the diamonds, the precious stones, the money, the assets, the paintings, which are now, in some cases, slowly being restored to the families that owned them. So people started to leave from 1933 on. As I said, a massive brain drain, the doctors and the scientists. In 1936, Germans had the Munich Olympics, and all this stopped for two weeks. They took down all the signs that said no Jews allowed. They allowed them to tra travel on the on the, on the buses and the trains and everything, just to make Germany look like a really pleasant land, just for the two weeks of the Olympics. And I think the International Olympic Committee has never really forgiven itself for allowing Germany to have the Olympics and promote national socialism in a way which, strangely enough, may not have occurred to you. The 1936 Olympics, the way it was staged by Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, is exactly the same way we celebrate it to this day. Before the 1936 Olympics, you had no opening ceremonies with flaming torches and, and things like that. What they did in 1936 has been continued to this day. September 1939, 393,000 Germans had left Germany or Austria, but 260,000 remained. And this is a lovely photograph of uh, uh, the USA were very reluctant to take come emigrate uh, Jews uh, because they believed that if they had any family that was still left in Nazi Germany, they might be turned into spies when they got to the United States. So their policy was not to take uh, very many Jews, and they didn't. Um, but those who could pay and had enough money to take with them to start up businesses and so on were able to go to the United States. In the UK, we took about 10,000 children. We called it the kinder transport. And they are, are a group of children arriving uh, in England uh, right just before um, uh, the invasion of the Low Countries and France in 1940. And they're wearing their labels. Um, and if you can imagine what it must have been like for the parents to put those children on a train and then a ferry and then find them with other families in England or schools. They were put in schools and, and uh, integrated into, into schools and, and families in the UK. The passengers below are getting on a Holland America line um, ship to, uh, to America. So Otto Frank's business, he'd set it up, he'd got his family there, and they had got there before 1939. They got there in 1933, and they had three very happy years living in a very um, affluent part of Amsterdam in an apartment. And he um, uh, operated this company, Op 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 Opecta, um, which was a pectin manufacturer, the additive that goes into jam to keep it solid, um, and also spices um, and, and other raw materials. And he then started another company, Pectacon, um, which provided the flavours for sausage meat and I presume for things like um, 
uh, meat patties, which we would now call a hamburger in those days in, in Holland or in, in the Netherlands, you certainly didn't call it that, but that's what he did. He started, he ran one company, he started another. As soon as the Germans invaded in 1940, the laws that were in Germany came into the occupied countries. The Netherlands was a neutral country, it made it very clear it was neutral. The Frank family lived, as I said, very comfortably. Um, Anne went to a Montessori school. Uh, Mar there's uh, Margot and, and Anne at the top there. There's Anne with her school friends. There's the apartment block that they lived in behind her. Here she is on the beach on a, in a deck chair. There she is at her Montessori school, a bit younger. And there's the family outside their apartment uh, prior to them moving. So they were a happy, ordinary, integrated, German, but Netherlands, Dutch family, with a community of friends around them and him employing a number of people. As soon as the Germans started to implement their policies, Otto Frank started to make preparations. First of all, preparations for them to actually leave. So the war starts on the 1st of September 1939, First, and with the Soviet Union attacking Finland. April the 9th, Germany invades Norway and Denmark with, uh, without any notice. And then Belgium, France, Luxembourg and the Netherlands. Um, worse than that, they didn't declare war. They declare war a bit like Japan on Pearl Harbor. They declared war about five or six hours after their paratroopers had landed. They then used the sort of tactics that we became used to, but at that time we had seen them in Warsaw, but we had not seen them anywhere else. And that was to threaten to obliterate cities unless the government surrendered. And the first city they threatened to obliterate was Rotterdam. And on the 14th of May, 1940, before, while they were still negotiating with the Dutch government, they bombed it. They bombed it terribly. There is Rotterdam after the Blitz of May the 15th, 1940. One tends to think of Blitzes happening in, in cities in England, like London and Coventry and so on, and Portsmouth, where we're going in a few days. That is what uh, Rotterdam looked like after the German Luftwaffe had finished with it. So the government surrendered, but if the government went into exile. Queen Wilhelmina took her government to England. Seven governments exiled to London. Six of them took with them their royal family, their government, troops, equipment, their treasuries and their natural resources. Seven of them. One of them took one man, President de Gaulle. Nothing else. The Dutch, of course, if they had surrendered to the Germans, the Germans would have had the Dutch East Indies, their colonies, which is rich with gold, basalt, bauxite, all sorts of raw materials. So Queen Wilhelmina came to the UK and she was the steadfast supporter of a government in exile which was immediately recognised by the London government, by the British government, but not by her own Prime Minister who was with her. He, and of course, constitutional monarchy, the Prime Minister advises the monarch and the monarch carries out the advice of the Prime Minister. So the Prime Minister advises Queen Wilhelmina that they should really surrender. After Rotterdam, we, we shouldn't allow any more of our, our, our um, Dutch civilians to be killed by the Germans. We must surrender. So what did Queen Wilhelmina do? She sacked him. And Winston Churchill said that she's the only man in the Dutch government. Today we have to admit that no happiness can be expected in this world if those who are solely responsible for the present situation are not definitely placed checked in their course of unscrupulous destruction and utter disregard of law and the most elementary 
principles of morality. And she broadcast to the Dutch people on a regular basis, and BBC formed Radio Netherlands, as they did form Radio Luxembourg, Radio Belgium, Radio France, um, and so on. All the nations that were occupied had a BBC station to which they could listen to. And the Frank family listened to... The, they, they managed to get a radio, and they listened to it um, regularly, and it became a main focal point for their information. So by 1940, and between their invasion in 1940 and 1942, life wasn't too bad in the Netherlands because the German administrators decided they would try to do with the Netherlands what they had done with France. Even though they had, the, the French had a Vichy government, they hoped that they would administer the Netherlands with what they called a velvet glove, and the Dutch people would eventually come round to National Socialism because, after all, they were Aryan, so they must believe in it. That's what the Germans thought. And so initially, there was a boom for the Netherlands because the Germans placed huge contracts with them for armaments and equipment and for food and, and, and all that sort of thing. So for the first year or so, things went reasonably well until the invasion of the Soviet Union. And as soon as Hitler turned his back after being beaten, and my next talk in two days is about him being beaten in the Battle of Britain, he turned his back on trying to invade England, he invaded the Soviet Union, things started to change for the Dutch. And this is what Europe looked like after Germany had invaded the Soviet Union. As you can see, there aren't many free countries left. There's a couple of neutrals, Switzerland, Sweden, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, although Spain and Portugal were marginally neutral. There are submarine bases still on the north coast of Spain that were used by the U-boats. The only free country is the one you'll hear about the day after tomorrow. The rest of it is all, all the way to St. Petersburg almost and almost to Moscow. That's where they got to. So the Netherlands suddenly became a very, very uncomfortable place for the Jews. These are the stati statistics. You can read them for yourself. In 1930, 111, 112,000. By 1945, there were 35,000. And you can take from that the fact that they, that was what returned or didn't leave Amsterdam, mainly Amsterdam. The government in exile left the military in control. And because it was so, the, the proportion of Jews in the Western European countries occupied by the Germans that went through the Holocaust and did not survive was higher than in any other country. There were a number of reasons for this. Prior to the Germans invading, the Dutch government had always, in their census, required people to state their religion. So the administration already had the details of the religions of all the population, including the emigres. The administration was very efficient. There was a certain amount of anti-Semitism in the Netherlands, as there was in most countries. But the detailed records and the compliance, because of this velvet glove approach of the first year or so, the authorities got used to dealing with the Dutch. Not just the Dutch administrators, but the Dutch police, the Dutch transport organization, their railroads, and, and so on and so on. And uh, when he was tried um, in Israel, Eichmann talked about the Netherlands as being the easiest place for the transportation of the Jews of all the countries of occupied Europe because of the way in which the Dutch authorities and the railways cooperated with their policies. And also, the first place they were sent to, and this includes the Frank family, was a place called Westerbork, which is north of Amsterdam, on the border of the Netherlands, right northern border of the Netherlands, which had, in 1939, been a reception centre for Jews who were fleeing Nazi Germany. So it was a relatively pleasant place. It had little cottages or huts for families to live in, barrack blocks for single people to live in. 
and it had a reputation as being a relatively pleasant place. So when people were initially sent there, and everybody who went on to suffer in the Holocaust from the Netherlands went through this camp, when they were being told, you've got to go to Westerbork, they thought that was no bad thing. So the knowledge of what was going on in the Holocaust was never as great in the Netherlands as it was in some other countries, because the start of the process seemed relatively benign. The other thing was that the government, the, du the Dutch government, through the Germans, actually paid a bounty to individuals to tell them if they knew where Jews were living or if they knew where Jews were being hidden. So you got actually paid to shop your neighbour, a bit like the Eastern Europeans in the Cold War. And here we have, and also the system was run by the Dutch. The Dutch police cooperated. Very, very few um, German soldiers, German police were necessary. So the Dutch Jews saw their own people, who they were used to, administering what they didn't really know was going on anyway. They also formed a Jewish council where other Jews were, in, were used to organize everything. So they were being organized by people they trusted, who also trusted that the people, what they were doing, was not going to be a bad thing. So it was very typically Nazi operation. Um, smoke and mirrors until they got to their final destination. These are photographs of them being rounded up in Amsterdam, the top photograph. And the bottom photograph is them boarding the train every Tuesday a train would leave Westerbork of this sort of size with this sort of number of people every Tuesday. Life for a Jew in Amsterdam at the time. Eventually they were forced to wear the Star of David. They had to register and have the letter J on the card, as I've said. They were not allowed to take public transport, so they had to walk everywhere. All men were called Israel and all women were called Sarah. They could only go to Jewish schools and Anne and Margot went to uh, the Jewish Lyceum for a bit. You cannot, they couldn't interact with Gentiles. They had no rights whatsoever. Anybody could do whatever they liked to you and you had no rights. So I said they had no passport, they couldn't own property. Otto Frank got around that by changing the ownership of the two companies that he was the managing director of to the workers that were non-Jewish the people in actual fact who helped him in the end. Can't play, join clubs, facilities. They can't part, take part in any normal life. So Otto saw this all coming. This is the property as it was then, 263 Princess Grach. Um, and that was the offices of Opecta. So that was where he worked with his, other, with his friends and so on. And that's the, the building empty. The interesting thing about the building is that it has an annex at the back here. This annex has no front door. It has a backyard and a sort of vestibule. But from the front, from this side, it's you have no idea how big the building is. And Otto identified this and with his friends in the company started to modify this part of the building to become where they could hide when they eventually had to go into hiding. And they were planning to go into hiding in August of 1943. But in July, on July the 6th, 1943, and there's the Frank family above, Margot, she was 15. That was her birthday. And at the age of 15, she got her, if you like, call-up papers to be going to Vesterbork to move and go and work as a, as a worker in Germany. And that decided Otto and Edith that they would move the whole family into the annex early, before it was fully prepared. So in order to get to the annex, that's the back of it, so you can see there's no, there's no rear door. It looks like, if you like, the front. You've no idea how deep it is. So Edith, Anne, Otto and Margot, um, on the morning of the 6th of July, they couldn't walk, they had to walk there, and it was about two kilometers, about one, one and a half miles. They had to walk there, middle of August, 
And they couldn't, if they'd been seen carrying suitcases with their yellow star on, they would immediately have been stopped. So they put every item of clothing they could on that they thought they might need while they were in the annex. So they were swaddled completely in clothing for the whole two kilometre walk. And when they got to the building, the first thing they did was to strip off all their clothes. And Anne was actually criticised for taking off her bloomers in front of the men. And she said, well, I've got three other pairs on underneath. She was a spitfire, Anne. So there they are when they went in, and their ages at uh, when they came out, uh, uh, when they went in, sorry. They were joined eventually um, by the Van Pels. The names in brackets underneath are the names that Anne used in her diary and her writings to disguise the names of the people that were in the annex with her in case uh, her, her diary was, was found by the Germans. So she used other names very sensibly. Uh, Fritz Pfeiffer joined about uh, three or four months later. He was a dentist married to a Gentile. Hermann and August van Pels joined a week or so later. He worked for Otto. He had been a butcher and he was working in the spice part of the, the business, the, the sausage additive part of the business, and their son Peter, who was 15. So here we have the, the, the people who lived in the annex. Here we have the brave hero people who helped them. Because any one of these, if they had been caught helping and the Germans had prosecuted them, they would have been immediately executed. So Meep Geese, Jan Geese, her husband, Meep is probably the, the most famous of all the people who helped. Um, Bep Voschgil, she was a, a, a typist, and her father, Johann, and Johannes Kleinman, um, who um, uh, Anne called Kupus, um, he and uh, Victor Kluger um, prepared the annex with Otto. And they would bring them everything that they needed. They would, every day they would visit. There was a certain period of time when all the workers, because the, the business still carried on, there was a time during the day when the workers went out for lunch. So that was the one time that they could A, make a noise, or B, receive visitors. And then when everybody went home from work, particularly Meep and Bep used to come up with food and the latest magazines for the girls, comics, uh, even some cigarettes for, for um, uh, Mr. Van Pels, because he, he smoked quite heavily. Um, and they risked their life every time they did this. Meep and Jan, they were also hiding another Jew in their own home. And that's the resistance in the Netherlands was not like the resistance you hear about in other occupied countries of Western Europe. They hid people. The country was not conducive to operating an armed resistance. A flat country, a lot of trees and, and, and not much forest, but a lot of water and, and so on. Not conducive to that. So most of the resistance was done by hiding people, which was just as dangerous. Anne's diary... She'd seen this book in, um, in a bookshop. And uh, on her birthday, on the 12th of June, 1942, um, she opened a parcel and discovered that her father had bought it for her. It wasn't actually a diary, it was an autograph book. But she immediately decided that she would use it as a diary. And she used to write to a fictitious friend called Kitty. Kitty was a character that she had learnt to enjoy in one of the girls' magazines of the time. So that is the book that we all probably have seen before, um, but there was a lot more to what she was doing than was actually in that book. This is the annex as told by the Montessori Education Project, although it was Anne speaking, it's from her diary. Straight ahead of you is a steep flight of stairs. To the left is a narrow hallway opening onto a room which serves as the Frank family's living room and bedroom. Next door is a smaller room, the bedroom and study of the two young ladies of the family. At this point Anne isn't yet aware that four months later she'll be sharing the little room with Fritz Pfeffer, the eighth person to join them in the secret annex. Margot will have to move into her parents' room. Anne continues with the secret annex's bathroom. To the right of the stairs is a windowless washroom with a sink. 
The door in the corner leads to the toilet and another one to Margot's and my room. If you go up the stairs and open the door at the top, you're surprised to see such a large, light and spacious room in an old canal-side house like this. It contains a stove, thanks to the fact that it used to be Mr. Kugler's laboratory, and a sink. This will be the kitchen and also Mr. and Mrs. Van Pels's bedroom, as well as the general living room, dining room and study for us all. A tiny side room is to be Peter Van Pels's bedroom. Then, just as in the front part of the building, there's an attic and a loft. So there you are. I've introduced you to the whole of our lovely annex. When they left their home to go to the annex, they left it as though they had disappeared and made it look like they had emigrated to Switzerland. They left bits of paper around and so on, um, and they strewed things all over the place. And they left her cat uh, and all sorts of other things to make it look, if anybody looked, that they'd disappeared and gone to another country. Meep went back to the house, and one of the things that Anne was particularly interested in was movie stars of the era. So as you saw in her room, Meep, about three months after they moved into the annex, one, one of the things she bought was a packet full of those pictures that she'd had on the walls of her bedroom in her home. So she still had those in the annex with her. This is the annex as they occupied it. This is storerooms for the company and workrooms for the company. There is the secret cupboard and the door crossing from the workplace of the company. And this is the area occupied by the Franks and their friends. And it's 815 square feet. If you get a chance, as I've said, the story now is much bigger than the story that we read or looked at when we were children. Because Otto, um, when he came back from the war and discovered eventually that his whole family had been murdered in the Holocaust, he went back to the office and Meep and Jan looked after him. When it was, and he, he believed that his two daughters would have survived. They thought he had died when they got to Auschwitz because they saw the men separated from the women and they saw their father disappear. But they hadn't. He, had, he was the only one who survived. When he went back, Meep waited until it was confirmed by the Red Cross that both Anne and Margot were dead to hand him a briefcase. He had given Anne a briefcase to hide her diary in and she had hidden all sorts of other papers in that briefcase. And when the man came to arrest them, he'd looked at the briefcase for jewels and valuables under that law that I told you earlier about. All he saw in it was papers and he just strewed them on the floor, saw there were no, no jewels, nothing valuable, and left them on the floor. Meep went back the next day saw what they were, knew how precious they were to Anne, picked them all back up, and put them, without looking at them, nobody had looked at them, put them into the briefcase. Otto comes back at the end of the war and reads the diary. And a lot of it is very, very private. A lot of it is about Anne growing up. A lot of it is about her own descriptions of the changes in her body. A lot of it is criticising her mother who at some point, as a teenager, she really couldn't stand. So Otto did what you would expect him to do. He edited it quite significantly. But now we're extremely lucky, because there is the definitive version. Penguin brought it out recently. You can acquire it on audiobook, and it's read by uh, Helena Bonham Carter. And she sounds really good reading, as Anne would have read. Um, and that's an audiobook version. And you can download that, ladies and gentlemen, for free off YouTube as an MP3 file and put it on your phone or your iPad or whatever you want and listen to it. I recommend it. It is incredible because it, it contains all of the pieces of paper and somebody has gone to the trouble to edit it back and put it into chronological order. So you've got the bits where she's really critical of her mother and then going back sometime later and saying, how could I have said that about my mother? 
I must have been a terrible person. And each time there's a correction. Also, the Dutch government in exile started to broadcast to the Dutch people, asking them to keep a record of what was happening to them, so that at the end of the war it would be recorded and not forgotten. As soon as she heard that broadcast, and they were terribly, terribly well informed in the annex, uh, not just by the BBC, but also by their helpers. As soon as she heard that, she decided that she would turn what had been a diary to Dear Kitty into a book, and that she wanted to be a journalist when she grew up. So she started to gather other bits of paper, that, scraps of paper, and write on those as well. And those were the things that were found in the, uh, in the briefcase and were handed to Otto. It's only recently that they have been put together as the definitive version. If I had time, I'd play you a sequence where she describes just lunchtime. And it's uplifting, it's hilarious in places, and when you read it, or, or even better listen to it actually, because it's like she's talking to you, um, even, it's a, so even though it's got a terrible result, it's a really uplifting story. So on the 4th of August 1944, this man turns up, Carl Silberbauer, an SS man accompanied by Dutch police, and they're arrested. He could not believe when, they, when he was told that they'd been in there over two years. Could not believe it. He searched the house. Um, he, he, as I say, threw, threw all the papers on the floor and they went to, first of all, a detention centre and then to Vesterbork. I sh want to show you this because these are all the concentration camps in occupied Europe in 1944. Uh, and they aren't all of them. There were 42,500,000 ,000 camps. Would you believe? Everyone had a subcamp, which had a subcamp, which had a subcamp. It's estimated that between 15 and 20 million people were imprisoned in these camps. They first of all went to Auschwitz, and this is them leaving Vesterbork in a relatively ordered fashion, as you've seen before with their suitcases. And this is the arrival at Auschwitz, which many of you are probably very familiar with. You went to the left or you went to the right. Anne was 15 two weeks before. Because she was 15, she was classed as an adult capable of work. So she didn't go straight to the gas chambers as everybody under 15 did. So this is the separation on the ramp uh, at Auschwitz-Birkenau. In October 1944, by then they were in a very bad state. Um, uh, Mother was almost dying of starvation. She was giving all her food to Margot and to Anne. So they wanted to stay with Edith, and they were offered, a, a, well, they were told they could go somewhere else, but they decided, and she wasn't. So the two girls decided to stay with Edith. They stayed a bit longer in Auschwitz than perhaps was wise. And when Edith died, they were transferred to Bergen-Belsen. At the time they were transferred to Bergen-Belsen, it looked a little bit like this. Disease was rife, typhus, typhoid, everything you can imagine. There was no sanitation. Uh, when the Allies took Belsen, it was one of the first ones that were put on the movie theatres um, in the home countries to explain to an astonished public the industrialised murder of the Jews and other minorities uh, by the Nazis in the Second World War. So these two double, long, long train journeys, taking up the resources of the German Wehrmacht during the Second World War constantly. And sadly, was in the very, very last batch that went from Westerbork to Auschwitz. If she hadn't got on that last train, she would have been one of the 500 people who survived. And these are the fate of the residences of the annex. And as you can see, only Otto survived. And the, the, the locations and the dates where they're known of the other residents are there on the left for you. When I returned and after I had the news that my children would not come back, Meep gave me the diary, which had been saved by... I should say, American. It took me a very long time to read it. 
And I must say, I was very much surprised about deep thoughts on the head. Her seriousness, especially her self-criticism. It was quite a different Anna I had known as my daughter. She never really showed this kind of inner feeling. She talked about many things, we criticized many things, but what really their feelings were, I only could see from the diary. And my conclusion is, as I had been in very, very good terms with Anna, that most parents don't know really their children. This is the house today, and I'm sure some of you are going to visit it on one of the, the tours. Uh, the foundation have now brought all the buildings to its right as you see it, and the entrance is on this side now. When I first went, you could actually go through the front door here still, and it's a massive and wonderful museum. Anne's Legacy. The diary was published in 1947, 55 languages, 25 million copies have been sold. There have been films. There is the, uh, first, the first film on, on your, your TVs in your staterooms. Um, it's not the best film, but it, it's one of the many that were made. The, some new documentaries recently have come out, books, statues, exhibitions all over the world. And Time magazine said that she was one of the most important people of the 20th century. I recently discovered the only piece of moving film of Anne, and I thought you might like to see it. It's uh, when they were living in Amsterdam, before they went into hiding, their next door neighbor got married. And this is the footage of the marriage couple with Anne looking out of the apartment window above. It's very short, you'll just see her quickly. There she is, up the top window, there she is. It's nice that we have some moving image of her. So, Anne Frank, writing in a diary is a really strange experience for someone like me, not only because I've never written anything before, but also it seems to me that later on neither I nor anyone else will be interested in the musings of a 13-year-old girl. Oh well, it doesn't matter. I feel like writing. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.